we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Richard Wilkinson. Richard Wilkinson studied economic history at the London School of Economics before training in epidemiology and is professor emeritus at the University of Nottingham Medical School and honorary professor at University College London. And he is co-author, along with Kate Pickett, of the new book, The Spirit Level, Why Greater Equality Makes Societies Stronger. So start out and tell us, what was your motivation in writing your new book, The Spirit Level? And maybe uh, include where the title comes from. (laughs) Well, first the title. In terms of the American markets, I think the title is a a, a silly mistake. <laughs> we couldn't think of a title for our book. Um, I spent a long time uh, um, worrying about it. Uh, then the publisher decided that because our book contains a number of graphs with sloping lines and so on, uh, and we're talking about income differences, uh, leveling and so on, Um, they suggested the spirit level, which in Britain uh, means the carpenter's level, you know, with a little tube and a bubble in it. Uh, But I didn't realize that Americans just call that a level or or a carpenter's level. You don't use the term spirit level. So it doesn't mean much to American uh, um, audiences. Why did we write it? Um, Well, I've been working for a very long time on a tendency for... Uh, more equal countries with small income differences between rich and poor to have better better overall health, longer life expectancy, for instance. And uh, we'd slowly realized that this was a pattern not just confined to health, but, for instance, it's also true of homicides um, and things like trust and social cohesion. They're all stronger. In, uh, the outcomes are worse in more unequal societies. And I'd written several times on this kind of stuff. But then we found that actually that picture applies uh, also to mental illness, to obesity, to drug abuse, uh, to child well-being, to teenage birth rates, a whole range of problems that we all know are more common in the poorest areas of our society. Uh, But we find they're much more common in more unequal societies as well. And I suppose that, uh, you know, I started to feel really confident of this picture about the time I I retired. And so I've really moved from uh, thinking about uh, research to um, something closer to campaigning. You know, in a way, research is about doubt and not knowing, whereas campaigning you can only do if you're really confident of a a picture. And... uh, It just happened that uh, we became confident that nearly all this picture must be right, even if we've got some minor details wrong. So the book was one last shot at uh, getting it onto the public agenda, making uh, politicians think about it and so on. All right. So tell us how you, uh, what data you looked at and uh, what the conclusions were. Yes, well... um, At first we did the analysis just looking at the rich developed countries. Um, We wanted countries uh, which in a way have got to the end of the benefits of of economic growth. And people don't realize it. And because we all want more money, people think that economic growth is beneficial. But it's no longer beneficial if you look at population life expectancy, or if you look at levels of happiness or levels of well-being. Growth matters still very much in poorer countries, but amongst the, you know, European Union countries, USA, Japan, Australia, uh, countries like that, uh, growth doesn't uh, bring the real social benefits that it used to any longer. We've got enough of everything, so it doesn't make much difference. So we were looking at those countries that have got to the end of economic growth. I mean, basically, we took the 50 richest countries in, in the world, throughout the ones with less than 3 million population, because we didn't want tax havens like the Cayman Islands and all that sort of stuff, and uh, then looked at the rest for which there is good data where you can compare the scale of income differences in different societies. So we did most of the analysis on those countries, but then we found the results so surprising that we tested it out independently on the 50 states 
And what we found in the countries was that the more equal countries with smaller differences between rich and poor did better on a whole range of problems. I, mean, I, I mentioned some of them, but let me run through the list again. I always have to write it down because I can't remember all the different uh, things that are worse in more unequal societies. Homicide rates, life expectancy, mental illness, obesity, drug abuse, levels of trust, uh, social cohesion, child well-being, teenage birth rates, all sorts of things like that um, are worse. So we checked it out to see if that was also true amongst the 50 states of the USA. And there's a sort of quite independent test bed um, and found exactly the same story. Uh, and uh, I suppose that, you know, made me really determined that we should get this onto the public agenda, um, make sure people do know about it. And in a way, what we're talking about is the, the real quality of life for human beings. I mean, all these problems are ones that worry people a lot. Oh, actually, I, I forgot one of them. Uh, it's imprisonment. The proportion of the population in prison in uh, more and less equal countries differs radically. Um, and these and these problems are not just a little bit more common in more unequal countries. Uh, in, in a comparison people did of uh, American states and Canadian provinces, you find the most unequal ones have homicide rates ten times as high as the most equal um, American states or Canadian provinces. We find, looking at it internationally, uh, slightly smaller differences but still closely related to inequality. Um, and if you take something like teenage birth rates, there are similar huge differences. Even mental illness, there are sort of threefold differences between how well and badly more and less equal countries do. Really important. So how do you define inequality? How did you come up with uh, numbers for that? Yeah, well... What we've done is take the scale of income differences. The measure we used, simply because it's available, you can download it from the World Bank or the United Nations websites, is how much richer are the top 20% in each country than the bottom 20%. And in the most equal of the, the advanced um, um, market democracies, countries like uh, Japan, Finland, Sweden, Norway, they're three and a half or four times as rich, the top 20% compared to the top bottom 20% in each of those countries. Whereas in Britain, the USA, Portugal, Singapore, um, it's uh, seven, seven and a half, even eight and a half times as rich. So we're almost twice as unequal as the more equal of the rich market democracies. And so, in a way, what we were doing was uh, just looking at the implications of those differences in the scale of inequality. And then the, the data on the different countries themselves, where does that actually come from? Uh, all sorts of sources. I mean, the, the health and uh, mental illness comes from uh, the, United, uh, sorry, the World Health Organization. Uh, data on drugs comes from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Homicide, I think, was also World Health. Um, I can't remember all of them. Uh, there's data on trust from the World Values Survey. Amongst the American states, we're nearly always using American government data. Um, always we use the most reputable sources we can find. And we also have a rule that we don't pick and choose the data. And that's really important because you could, you know, you could make any um, thing stand up if you did that. So we take all the data there is, um, warts and all. All right. And then uh, countries like India and China, you didn't include them from... No, not amongst the 50 richest in the world that we were interested in. And in those countries, economic growth is still really important. You know, it still does lead to increases in life expectancy and... Uh, happiness and so on. It's it's only amongst in the rich world that's no longer true. How does one measure happiness? Where does that? No, oh, there are questionnaires on that. In fact, we don't look at happiness. Um, other people have in great detail. There's a book by Richard Layard on on happiness, but there are now a number of economists uh, looking at the economics of happiness. You know, as people become more worried about um, whether GNP per capita, gross national income per capita, is really uh, the most important goal of our societies, um, <clears throat> people have started thinking, well, we need other measures of well-being. And one of them, of course, um, is, is happiness. 
um, and uh, that usually is, is questionnaire data. But um, we wanted rather to choose things with fairly hard outcomes um, rather than simply opinions. I mean, one or two things are, are opinion, <clears throat> like whether or not people feel they can trust others. Um, but when you're talking about homicide rates or obesity or uh, teenage birth rates, you know, that's hard data. So you found uh, pretty much across the board in countries like here in the U.S., the disparity between the rich and the poor is what factor is that roughly about? You said about seven or eight times difference. Well, actually, um, we use uh, the measure I described, the ratio of the top to bottom 20 percent internationally. But in American states, uh, we use um, from the uh, American census uh, something called the Gini coefficient, which uh, is a different but more complicated measure of inequality right across the population. We use that, again, simply because it's available. Um, and we wanted to avoid people saying, well, they've done something funny in the calculations. So all the figures we wanted completely above board. I should mention, actually, that we were also worried that people would think we'd just chosen health or social problems that suit our argument. So we also looked at child well-being. Uh, UNICEF, the United Nations, has a measure of child well-being for rich countries. Uh, it contains 40 different components um, in every aspect of, of child well-being. So, for instance, whether kids can talk to their parents, whether there's bullying at school, how much they do, how well they do in the international maths and literacy tests, um, uh, immunization rates, all sorts of aspects of, of child well-being go into it. And the advantage from our point of view is uh, we didn't choose those components, but we find exactly the same pattern. Um, child well-being is very substantially determined related uh, to inequality um, and remarkably unaffected by how rich or poor uh, a country is, I mean, a country amongst the rich developed ones. So, you know, countries like the US and Norway um, are twice as rich as countries like Greece, Israel, Portugal, and yet that doesn't seem to affect child well-being. But the scale of income differences within each society uh, has an enormous effect. So Norway has much smaller income differences than the US, and its children do much better. In Britain, our children do particularly badly. We have um, big income differences. So for all the factors you looked at, were you surprised when you kept finding? Yes. I, in, in a way, I blame myself for having worked on the tendency for uh, life expectancy to be better in more equal countries. I've worked on that, I don't know, for 20, 25 years. Um, and gradually, I realized that there were a few criminologists who showed shown something similar uh, for homicide rates, and uh, I had got data s showing that um, things like trust and uh, social cohesion are better in more equal countries. But I didn't quickly make the jump to realizing that this applied to a whole lot of other social problems. And I, I'm surprised I didn't, because I think many people, I mean, for hundreds of years, people have had an intuition that inequality is, is, is divisive and socially corrosive. And in a way, that's all the data shows. But it shows it, I, mean, I think I imagined if inequality made any difference, that maybe if you could have a sort of perfectly utopian, e equal society, the kind of society that never exists, um, that you'd see it really was different. But most of us have to live in the real world, where the big inequalities. I never imagined that the differences in inequality between different rich developed market democracies would have such important differences in outcome. You know, like these huge differences in, in mental illness, teenage births, homicide, maths and literacy scores of kids. And, uh, and it was realizing how big these effects were, how important they were, that made me just feel um, I have to get this knowledge out, get people to understand it. And did the form of government factor into this at all? Did you see any difference there? Um, well, as I said, they are all um, market democracies. 
Uh, there are quite important differences uh, between how countries become, uh, well, in terms of the, the more equal ones. Uh, it's clear there are big government ways and small government ways of becoming more equal. Uh, for instance, um, at the most equal end are Sweden and uh, Japan. Um, Japan has, uh, well, let's take Sweden first. It has very large differences in earnings. Uh, and they get their equality by redistributing through taxes and benefits. Uh, Japan, on the other hand, uh, has much smaller differences in earnings to start with. They do less redistribution, they don't have such a big welfare state, um, and we find rather the same contrast amongst some of the more equal American states. Um, New Hampshire, for instance, uh, is one of the more equal states, and it has good outcomes in terms of these sorts of problems, uh, but uh, it, I think, has the lowest uh, state taxation of any state except Alaska, uh, and low social expenditure. Uh, so there are big government ways and small government ways of getting greater equality, and I suppose I was rather glad to find that, because uh, the fear always, I suppose, is that it's only the, the f more left governments uh, that will do anything about taxes and benefits. But actually, uh, on the political right, I think uh, there are quite a number of people interested in local democracy and uh, things like employee ownership and and stuff like that. Uh, interested in small-scale local democracies, people taking charge of their own lives. And if actually, if you do that by subjecting our work organizations uh, to greater economic democracy and so on, um, I think that maybe you can rein in the, the, the sort of bonus culture which has existed only because most of us have had no say whatsoever in what people at the top get in our companies. Yeah, it would seem that there's a lot of uh, organizations or, uh, out there that would be interested in your work uh, in supporting it. For instance, uh, it was occurring to me while you're talking about the homicide rates uh, being totally dependent on the inequality gap. It seems like the NRA would here in the states, the uh, gun rights group mm -hmm. would would be clinging to your book because it would show that you know. Gun proliferation in the U.S. has nothing to do with the homicide rate. It's the inequality gap. It doesn't. Uh, gun ownership has some influence. It's not as as powerful as uh, inequality. But uh, Finland, for instance, uh, although it's very equal, it has surprisingly high gun ownership, and it has had a number recently of these, uh, you know, people just killing a few people before they kill themselves. Uh, those kinds of incidents. Uh, I, I think gun ownership uh, does contribute to higher death rates, but it's not the overriding factor at all. I mean, I believe that Canada has a similar number of guns per head of population as the US, but much, much lower homicide. Uh, and, um, oh, I've forgotten the other point I was going to make about that. Sorry. <laughs> so, Talk about the uh, impact that friendship has on one's uh, health. Yes, that's interesting. I mean, in relation to the uh, sense that I think people have often had that uh, inequality is divisive, uh, and the evidence we now have that that's true, that involvement in community life falls away, that people trust each other less, that violence is more common in more unequal societies, uh, over the last 20 years or so, um, people have come to realize, working on, on uh, the determinants of population health in the rich countries, that uh, social, the quality of social relations is really important. Uh, it seems to work through chronic stress. I mean, people's uh, levels of stress um, in the long run seem to affect the immune system, the cardiovascular system, uh, and if you're chronically stressed over long periods, um, it uh, makes you more vulnerable to a whole range of, of diseases, particularly the, and it looks a little bit like uh, uh, as if it speeds up uh, the aging process. Um, but it, it's interesting, it's not just observational studies where, you know, you look at people with friends or good relationships with their partners or people involved in community life and find they do better and you try and control for income and education and stuff like that. But people have also done experiments where, for instance, they make a little tiny puncture wound on the back of the hand of volunteers, 
and measure how quickly it heals. And if you have a good relationship with your partner, it seems to heal faster than if uh, you have a more stressful, difficult relationship. People have also done work where you give volunteers nasal drops with cold viruses in um, and also get them to answer a questionnaire about um, the number of friends they have. And you find that from that same measured exposure to infection, uh, people with few friends, uh, people who are more isolated, are four times as likely to get colds. Um, it, it's quite extraordinary, the importance of the social environment as a source of stress. Um, and that seems to be one of the important reasons why uh, health is worse in more unequal countries. It damages the quality of the social fabric, damages social cohesion. Talk about the uh, diseases that tend to hit the poor and change as countries and the people within a country become more affluent. Yes, that's an interesting process. It's, I mean, we mention it in the book, but um, uh, as countries get richer, uh, and the diseases of absolute poverty seem to fall away. So the big uh, 19th century infectious diseases that used to be such important killers in childhood and uh, amongst young people, not just amongst the elderly, those start to disappear. They remain important killers in the much poorer countries, uh, but you also see that the diseases that we uh, call the diseases of affluence, um, things like heart disease and so on, uh, the degenerative diseases, cancers, become the diseases of the poor in affluent societies. You know, heart disease has been a rich man's disease, and throughout history it's the been, been the uh, rich who've been fat and the poor who've been fit thin. That's reversed, and as countries get richer, those sorts of diseases reverse their social distribution and become more common at the, at the bottom. Uh, but we are talking just about uh, countries that have gone through that transition. Uh, now our death rates are nearly all, uh, well, very largely older people dying. Uh, we don't have those huge death rates we're used to in, in infancy. Could you also talk about, in, here in the U.S., of course, you're aware we're having a major health care debate for lack of a better word, <laughs> it doesn't seem like uh, too much debate uh, to me. But uh, healthcare expenditures here in the U.S. seem uh, pretty high compared to the rest of the world, and yet our healthcare system, or at least what we get of our, out of our healthcare system, doesn't really seem adequate. Yes, a, people tend to think that healthcare, why we're healthier than than we were a few generations ago, is because of uh, modern medicine. That appears not to be true. Most of those great uh, 19th century killers declined uh, to a tiny fraction of what they were uh, before medicine had anything to offer at all, before immunization, before treatment, and, and so on. Uh, if you look internationally, at, for instance, at life expectancy in relation to medical expenditure or medical provision per head of population, you find no relationship. That doesn't really mean that uh, medicine is pointless or, or uh, ineffective. It just means that its effects are overshadowed by the power of the social and economic factors that uh, I've been talking about. Um, uh, one of the... Sp uh, and basically more important than the treatment you get for cancer or heart disease is whether you get it in the first place. And there's such huge differences in how frequently these uh, conditions occur in populations, that it overshadows the important contribution that medicine can make. But medicine uh, is important in terms of the quality of life, dealing with hernias and cataracts and uh, hip joints and stuff like that. Big, uh, a major contribution to the quality of life for many people, um, but maybe not a very big influence on death rates. Uh, and one of the reasons for that as well is that something like three-quarters of all medical expenditure goes in your last year of life. So it can't have a very big effect on um, uh, the length of your life. So you uh, have pulled all this data together and gotten some outstanding reviews from people who one would anticipate might be critics of your work, both like The Economist and The Financial Times. 
give you praise. Yes, we've been rather surprised what a, an easy ride we've had. I think The Economist said that the evidence was hard to dispute, uh, sort of grudging approval, I suppose. Um, but uh, one of the things I haven't said uh, that I think is important is that inequality seems to increase status competition. You know, if the differences between the people at the top and bottom are, are bigger, uh, then we seem to judge people by, more by social status, and where you are becomes even more important. So status competition and inequality drive consumerism. And basically, I think people know that consumerism is, is pretty hollow. I mean, surveys show that something like three-quarters or 80% of the population think of consumerism as involving a sacrifice of more important human values, and they often mention friends and family and community and stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're driven by this sort of force that people don't understand, which actually is extraordinarily socially destructive. Oh, certainly so here in the U.S. So what do you hope to accomplish with this book? And uh, what, if you were put in charge of, uh, of the U.S., the appropriate programs here in the U.S. for expenditures or whatever, what would you do? Well, I, when I say that the different ways of uh, increasing equality, I think we need to use them all. So... Taxes and benefits is part of it. Um, the danger is that they can be undone by the next government that comes in. I think we need to get a, a more equal structure, more deeply rooted in our societies, uh, through all sorts of forms, almost any form of greater economic and workplace democracy, by which I mean having more uh, mutuals, more friendly societies, more employee ownership, more cooperatives, um, more employee representatives on the board, because as I said at the beginning, I think that the bonus culture, the way the rich have run away from the rest of us uh, over the last 20 years, that's why the gap uh, in incomes has widened so much, has been possible only because they are completely unaccountable uh, to other people, to the employees in their company, and they've often given themselves these bonuses while laying off people or holding down wage demands uh, lower in the company. Uh, that's simply a lack of any kind of economic democracy. And interestingly, I mean, people say that uh, 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 if a company goes to employee buyout, it changes it from being a piece of property to a community. It's at work that uh, wealth is not only created, but uh, uh, that it's divided up and the inequalities are created. It's also where we're most subjected to authority you know, to hierarchy with bosses and, you know, the underlings and all that. We are talking with Richard Wilkinson. He is co-author, uh, along with Kate Pickett, of the new book, The Spirit Level, Why Greater Equality Makes Societies Stronger. And uh, you are also a co-founder of the Equality Trust. Can you briefly tell us what that is? Yes, we started it, uh, I suppose, about a year ago. Uh, simply because we felt we were sitting on something much more important than I'd ever th thought I'd uh, find as uh, after a career in, in research. Um, and we just had to get it out there. So the web, uh, we, we have a website, uh, www.equalitytrust.org.uk. Uh, we were given some funding from a Quaker charity in the, the UK, the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Um, and now we're getting contributions as well from other people. Um, we're very small, uh, but uh, you can download some of the slides and pick up some useful stuff, so do visit it. Um, and basically it, it is just to make this kind of evidence better known. And I think it's really important, particularly in relation to the changes we're going to have to make faced with climate change and reducing carbon emissions. Uh, it feeds into that too. So with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Oh, it's very nice to be invited to. Thank you.